Welcome to the Center for Court Innovations short training series on helping court staff understand domestic violence cases. This is part two, why was the order dropped and other common questions from courts. So what exactly makes domestic violence cases challenging for courts? Domestic violence cases often present challenges that court staff don't find in other case types. In our experience training court staff and asking what makes domestic violence cases particularly hard, the things you see on the screen were the most commonly cited responses. Did you think of any of these? Both parties are using violence. The petitioner is using allegations of domestic violence to get an advantage in a custody case. The alleged victim doesn't want to cooperate with court staff, the judge, or attorneys. The victim comes into court repeatedly and seems to move from one abusive partner to the next, putting themselves in bad situations. The survivor returns to the abusive partner despite the abuse, and the petitioner doesn't follow through with orders. All of these statements suggest that perhaps the survivor or petitioner doesn't really want help from the court. One of the most common questions from court staff with cases involving domestic violence is why litigants drop orders. Petitioners come to court and file for an emergency order and then might not show up to the next court date, or perhaps they get the order and later ask the judge to drop it. Oftentimes, survivors come to the court after a domestic violence incident and then later deny or minimize incidents even those that are severe. They may even take responsibility for the violence, saying that they instigated the abusive partner. Survivors sometimes refuse to testify or cooperate with attorneys, especially on criminal cases that hinge on their testimony. They may even appear hostile and argumentative with court staff. Why is that so common, and what's the responsibility of court staff? To answer that, Let's think about the perspective of the survivor. What makes the court process challenging for them? There are many reasons why survivors may not pursue an order of protection or other types of legal relief. Oftentimes, victims of domestic violence are viewed in ways that diminish their right to self-determination and autonomy. It's important to remember that while leaving an abusive relationship and getting an order of protection seem like an obvious choice, it's not always the best or safest path for the survivor, who's an expert in their own safety. Court staff and other justice system stakeholders only see a part of what's going on in a relationship. The survivor may be dealing with threats or pleading from the person causing harm to drop an order, especially when it could impact employment or result in jail time. The survivor may fear further repercussions from the person causing harm or even their friends or family, or the survivor may simply believe things will be different this time. Moreover, survivors may return to the person causing harm for a number of reasons as well. Survivors are often balancing several competing interests. The most common barriers in domestic violence cases involve finding safe and affordable housing, providing for children and ensuring custody rights, being able to access the court despite issues with transportation, scheduling, confusing forms, and language access. Many survivors are economically dependent on their abusive partners, who often control both parties' finances and may even do things in retaliation, like cancel health insurance, cancel credit cards, or run up bills and drain shared bank accounts. Remember that leaving is only one of many strategies to stay safe. Leaving the person causing harm through domestic violence can be the most dangerous time for a survivor, since their partner may feel like they're losing control over the relationship, leading to heightened violence. In fact, most cases of domestic violence-related homicide occur after a survivor has left the relationship. If the survivor is experiencing more threatening and stalking behavior, they may feel staying or returning to relationship may be safer than leaving.
The court process itself can be confusing and frustrating, and the path to safety is often full of obstacles and setbacks for survivors, any of which can send them back to the person causing harm. That's why it usually takes several attempts before a survivor can finally leave for good. Do you know the barriers survivors face while seeking help from courts? Survivors may be facing compounded trauma by having to explain and relive the incidents of violence and having to face the abusive partner in court. The abusive partner may also be dealing with trauma, including violence they may have witnessed growing up. While trauma does not excuse abusive behavior, it may help practitioners design and provide the most effective treatment to end further abuse. The person causing harm may even be using the legal process to further abuse and harm by filing a mutual protective order or repeated motions, bringing their friends and family to court to intimidate the survivor, alleging the survivor is an unfit parent, delaying the case repeatedly, and more. If litigants have overlapping cases or are working with different judges and stakeholders, They may have issues making it to each court date or key information may be lost, making it difficult for courts to provide consistent support. Survivors may not have access to an attorney, forcing them to decipher legal documents and concepts. They may be facing other accessibility issues in getting to court and getting around the courthouse, particularly if they're living with a disability or limited English proficiency. Finally, survivors may have limited resources, namely those in smaller communities, and may also struggle financially while waiting for court order support, like child support. All of these court-based barriers can be deeply discouraging for litigants and cause them to drop an order of protection, especially if they're not sure they have the financial, emotional, and community support to leave a relationship. This information might make you question how you can stay neutral in cases involving domestic violence. For court staff concerned with the issue of neutrality in domestic violence cases, know that you can fulfill your responsibility to be neutral towards litigants while promoting a safe court environment for survivors and their families. Understanding the underlying dynamics and safety issues in domestic violence cases does not mean providing preferential or special treatment for one litigant over another. In fact, court staff can and should treat all litigants with dignity and respect while also responding to the unique safety concerns involved when domestic violence is present. In their roles, court staff can remain neutral while linking both parties to additional services, providing legal information, participating and even leading collaborative efforts around domestic violence, like developing a stakeholder team or information sharing strategies for these cases, and promoting education for themselves, their colleagues, and additional court staff on domestic violence. So given the challenges with dropped orders, what exactly is the responsibility of court staff in these situations? To better assess any gaps in your court system's response to domestic violence, consider engaging in a system mapping activity. This involves mapping the pathway of a survivor from the violent incident until their case or situation is resolved, and every point in between where they're interacting with the system and receiving services. System mapping helps staff review forms, processes, available and missing resources, etc. from a survivor's perspective. Once you've identified gaps, collaboration with community-based service providers will help broaden the court's perspective on the community being served and what resources are available outside of court. Specifically, the court can better understand the perspective of survivors by reaching to victim services and advocacy organizations, as well as engaging abusive partner intervention programs to learn what can work with people who cause harm. Litigants who drop orders and later return to court, even if it occurs repeatedly, should not be treated any differently from those who come into court for the first time. While it may be frustrating for staff, the best response is to assume survivors are experts in their own lives and their own safety and may have legitimate reasons for dropping a previous order. Court staff may also consider reflecting on any internal biases towards litigants on domestic violence cases. This includes refraining from using terms like frequent flyer to describe litigants, 
which not only dehumanizes them, but can also impact the court staff's attitudes and behaviors. Finally, and most importantly, court staff can maintain a welcoming environment that encourages litigants to return to court, regardless of how many times it takes for them to leave an abusive partner. To learn more about this topic and for any further training questions, contact us at dvinfo at courtinnovation.org.